My name is Jim. I'm one of the global board members of the International OWASP Foundation. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit charitable organization. OWASP does not endorse my commercial company or any company. We're a nonprofit. So um, what I do at OWASP, what I do professionally are two separate things. By the way, don't hack without written permission. There's some tips in hacking here. Unless you have written legal permission to do so, don't try hacking. So where are we going? We're going to talk about HTTPS, configuration issues, certificate pinning, forward secrecy, and strict transport security. I'm going to move fast. Grab the recording if you miss anything. This is Nick Weaver, some random guy I troll off the internet. He said something very wise. He's like, any unencrypted traffic visible to the adversary, it's not just an information leak, it's an avenue for attack that the attacker can use to exploit your systems. Like we saw in the last module, uh, or the last session, an attacker can inject any code they want into an HTTP or poorly configured HTTPS connection and add evil JavaScript or other attacks in doing so. This is Bruce Schneier, one of the leaders internationally in, uh, in cryptography. He says, cryptography is only truly useful if the rest of the system is secure. Many people who I ask, is your website secure? You know what their answer is? I got HTTPS, I'm good to go. No, that's, w that's like one of 50 things you need to do to get a good website to be secure. So don't be fooled into thinking that this is complete security. It's just one of many pieces that we need to get right. We need to get authentication, access control, user interface security, transaction security, and data protection at least correct to have a secure system. All right, this is Daniel Cuthbert. He's a cheeky bastard and a security genius. And he says, when conducting a penetration test, I will break into your network and start sniffing all of your data before I even take my pants off. The real lovemaking has not even begun yet. And, th and if this offends you, I'm sorry. But the point of this is, the idea of an attacker breaking into your network and beginning to sniff plane tracks traffic, that's not even a real attack. They haven't even got it started yet. This is hacking 101. Most networks are easy to crack into in some way. And so don't be lured into thinking that plain text traffic anywhere is acceptable. We want to get security, HTTPS done everywhere. So we want to talk about SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. But SSL is dead. The real thing we should be talking about is TLS, Transport Layer Security. If we look at the history of SSL and TLS, back in 98 when it first came out, only a small number of sites had impartial, incomplete HTTPS configuration. As we move to the, the uh, uh, early era of privacy, we have a large rise in the use of TLS and HTTPS. Still very poorly configured at this point. As we enter the mobility age and mobile applications, are beginning to do are beginning to cause a huge rise in secure transport around the same era we see fire sheep and easy tools that make stealing data relatively easy on a network and this is about the same time here we see ssl sniff from oxymoron spike which defeats most implementations of https now then we have the snowden affair where you know one of the usa nsa agents reveals a massive trove of secrets about what not just the us but governments around the world are doing in violation of people's privacy. This caused another giant leap in the use of HTTPS. And what Google found out about here is that the NSA was not just hacking people, the NSA was hacking Google. They were sniffing data between their data centers and getting all the data from Google. They weren't hacking their systems directly, they were taking advantage of poor transport security yet again. And so Google now is encrypting all data heavily, massively, even between their data centers. And now we're in the internet of everything, where your toaster has internet connectivity now. I'm not even kidding when I say that. So, and, and Google is now using their power as a big internet behemoth to make HTTPS stronger in some ways. So in this story, I mostly see Google as a good guy some but a little bit of a bad guy too. Well, you can judge for yourself as we go through this. So in a nutshell, SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. The name SSL is tied up in copyright. So when they came up with SSL 3.1, they renamed the protocol to TLS, Transport Layer Security. The point is they're pretty much the same thing. Let's move on. And by the way, what is HTTPS? HTTPS is a combination of TLS, Layer 3, Transport Layer Security, on top of H uh, HTTP on top of TLS. 
So there is no such thing as the HTTPS protocol. It's just a scheme that combines HTTP over a TLS network, uh, network transport that is secure. When you use TLS, what's the whole point of using HTTPS and TLS? The whole point of this is we get three major tangible benefits. That's confidentiality. The adversarial spy on your network can't sniff your data if you're doing this right. You get integrity. The adversarial spy on your network can't change your data without alerting you to that fact. And number three, authenticity. That means that the server you're visiting, www.awesomeswedishhipstermeatballs.se, we know that that's the right site we're visiting over HTTPS, not some fraudulent site. Which, how does this authenticity work? Which system in the world today manages the authenticity of HTTPS and the web? That's the certificate authority system. What do you think of, the, do you even think about it? And if you do, what do you think of the certificate authority system in the world today? I'm gonna, what's that? I agree. I'm gonna use a technical term when I describe it. It's complete bullshit. Any question? I'm gonna show you why in just a moment. Let's go through this. And I'm primarily talking about TLS, <coughs> excuse me, in a one-way fashion. You can use TLS in two directions. You can have it one way where I open up a server, anyone can connect to it over HTTPS, or we can have mutual TLS, like between your web server and your database. When should you have plain text sensitive data on your network? Let me say that again. When, when should you do this? Never. Absolutely never. Guess who does it though? Almost everybody. Betw How many of you have strong encryption between your web server and your database server? The answer is probably very few. One out of, uh, out of, uh, out of like 50 or so, two. There's no such thing as a private network. Not, let's, let's go back in time. Let's go back to 1972. Salter and Schroeder released all the original information security white papers. Back when there was big collars, ABBA was cool. Remember the 70s? I'm not that Neither am I, but uh, that's what I heard about it. <laughs> They say never trust the infrastructure, assume it's compromised. We have to go back to our friend, the cheeky bastard, Daniel Cuthbert. This, I'm being serious, this is a real quote from him. He's is a professional security professional. He used to, be a, used to be a hacker, he almost got arrested once. And he said, for me to break into your network and get a piece of malware in your network sniffing traffic, that's not even getting started. That's just an early attack. So if you trust your network, that's usually uh, a radical flaw in security thinking because the networks are porous. Mobile phones, tablets, everybody wants access to these services. The network is becoming more and more porous. And the possibility of protecting a network is now almost impossible. And so don't, you don't trust the infrastructure and everything you do within your network, you lock it down as if an adversary was on your network. Who here works for a multi-billion dollar or euro company? And so who works for a large company? Hey, will you, if I give you a little piece of software, will you install it on your network for me, please? What if I give you 100 bucks? What if I give you 500 bucks? What if I give you 5 million, a mark euro that's in my bag right now? 5 million euro, 10 million euro, 20 million euro? What's your price? You gotta have a price. What's that? We'll talk after class. See what I'm saying? The average cost to bribe a secret agent in the U.S. is $10,000. The average cost to bribe a top secret agent is about $20,000. Don't trust your network. So what makes up TLS? What makes up TLS? It's a graceful combination of symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Symmetric crypto is one key, super fast, very strong, but with symmetric crypto, we cannot exchange keys over a public network. We have to exchange keys in private, which makes it much more complex to use over the internet. Now, when you have asymmetric cryptography, the whole point of asymmetric cryptography is that now we can exchange public keys over a public network and establish secure transport. Now, usually those public keys are signed by some authority, so we know we have the right public key. But the problem with asymmetric crypto, it is much, much slower than its symmetric counterparts. So TLS uses both of these. They start with asymmetric crypto, we exchange keys in public, have a super strong but very slow connection. We then exchange symmetric key material, drop the TLS connection, and now we have a symmetric connection that's very fast because we shared that key over a secure connection. 
So this is, this is how TLS works. I think it's a very, very good idea. We've had many problems. Now remember, on the internet, when you, I want to verify your server is the right server in my browser, I'm going to get a public certificate from your website. What if you build a website, build your own keys, deploy it, and then push your server live? What error will we see in the browser if you make your own certificates and stop there? Certificate uh, self-signed, or we don't, we don't recognize a certificate, this is not the right site. So we have to take our public key and go to a certificate authority and get them to sign our key and give it back to us. If you look in your browser today, you'll see that in the browser, in the browser today, in your settings, this is every browser is like this now. Hello, in your preferences, where am I going? I'm just not, I'm just, I just, they just changed this on me, I'm sorry. Uh, certificates, view certificates, bingo. These are all the public certificates of every certificate authority that Microsoft, Google, and Mozilla loosely agreed upon, keyword loosely, about 300 certificates. So th this is how the internet uh, deals with um, authenticity. That's how you know you have the right website because whoever built the website takes their public key, goes to an authority, the private key of an authority signs your public key, then the public key of the authority in your browser verifies that that signature is correct. Hey, guess what happens if I'm on, a net, if I'm on the network between you and your web server? What if I intercept your traffic, give you a completely fake public certificate to the web server, but I sign it with the real authority? What does your browser say? says everything is okay. That's how governments and very powerful adversaries exploit HTTPS. They will take the public, they will make a fake certificate, they, have a, they sign it with an authority's private certificate, and the browser doesn't complain. Question, go ahead. The, the, your public key of your server is signed by the private key of the authority, and then your public key signed by the private key of the authority is verified by the public key of the authority that's inside of your browser. Private authority key signs, public authority key verifies. Cool? So let's charge on. So where should we, first of all, let, let's go back to the beginning for a second. You gotta update your OS latest patch level. If you're still using Apache 1.3, what the F are you doing? Stop now, run, update your server to at least Apache 2.2.2.4. Apache 1.3 and below was end of life in 2010, yet there's a large percentage of people who are still doing this. If you're using Apache 1.3, run and go fix it. We'll wait for you here. And so, the first three versions of TLS, SSL 1, 2, and 3, they're all broken. They have major implementation flaws that cannot be fixed. So SSL 1, 2, and 3 are gone. Turn it off on your server, disable it on the client. Pretty much every browser has disabled SSL 3 except for one browser, Safari. Shame, shame. They'll get there, they'll get there though. Um, I'm gonna skip this for a moment to make up some time. We have a whole bunch of failures. The most recent failure I'm going to describe, there's been a few failures past this, is Poodle. This is the death of SSL 3.0. It's a combination of a downgrade attack and something called an oracle padding attack. When you're using a block cipher in cryptography, you're encrypting in chunks, so the last block of your encryption may have a couple zeros at the end. It only fills up the last part of the block. So you want to use a padding scheme to make that appear random. So, um, and if you don't pad block ciphers properly, you're going to get, uh, you, you're going to be able to allow the attacker to decrypt that relatively easy. Let's look at how Poodle attacks work. First of all, I would get an evil Wi-Fi and set it up in a public area, something like a pineapple or a Wi-Fi router that I control. I'll connect that router to public internet or other internet. Then as people start, start making connections through this evil router, this evil Wi-Fi router, as an attacker, I can inject JavaScript into any HTTP web page. Now that JavaScript could be a Poodle attack, which will then in turn make requests from the browser to the HTTPS site that that user is logged into that you're trying to target and steal their information. So first, you inject the JavaScript, you then make the JavaScript connection via TLS to the server you're attacking, you break TLS and force that server to downgrade down to SSL3, and now we got a basic Oracle padding attack, and after about 4,000 requests, we can steal the user's cookie. 
How much is 4,000 requests? It's not that much, to be honest with you. So you want to disable SSL3 everywhere. There is no excuse to use SSL3 anywhere. It only provides the illusion of security, not actual security. You can also use fallback configuration here as well. Now, by the way, the other problems with HTTPS is that the browser fails open. When people see these messages, this is saying HTTPS is broken. People just click through. 30 to 70% of users click through. And I think all the browser vendors are doing this much better today. These numbers are going down. Let's talk about history for a second. Back in February of 2012, Trustwave, who's a, a certificate authority, they uh, served the U.S. DO Department of Defense and the U.S. government and many other governments. They took their private key. By the way, when you're an authority, there's, o there's only like 300 authority keys in the world today, 300 private authority keys in the world. When you're an authority, should you be selling your private key to public companies? Absolutely not. Trustway was doing this in, early in late 2011 and 2012. They realized that for whatever reason, they realized it was a bad idea. They went to the news and said, look, we've been selling our private key. We decided to revoke it and stop doing this. This was a mistake, and we'll never do it again, whatever. But they said something very telling. They said, look, yeah, we sold our certificate. We're jerks. We're not doing it anymore. But guess which other authority in the world today sells their certs in some way? All of them. That's what they warned us, and they were right. By the way, if I have a private certificate of an authority, even in an HSM, I put it in a router, a blue coat device or similar router. I see HTTPS connections coming in. I just make a fake certificate, sign it with the real authority, and now I can man the middle anybody with relative ease, especially back in 2012. So let's jump ahead in time now. Let's look at December, where we were, where we were. We were at February of 2012. We're now at the end of 2012. The Turkish government began issuing Gmail and Google Calendar and other certificates to different Gmail services that were signed by Turk Trust. They weren't the real Gmail certificates. They were fake Gmail certificates signed by the Turk Trust Authority. What was Turkey doing? What was the Turkish government doing back in 2012? It rhymes with fly. They were spying on their populace in some way. And so the thing that they didn't realize is that Google Chrome had just implemented the first browser implementation of certificate pinning and pushed it live. This is what pinning is. What Google did was they took the public key of Gmail, essentially. They took all the different public keys of different Gmail servers, and they hard-coded it in the browser. They own the browser. It's Chrome. That way, when, someone gives, when they make a request to Gmail, and the returning certificate is anything but the exact match of Gmail, Chrome complains and tells the user they're being man the middle. So Turkey was the first one to get caught doing this at scale. What did Google do? Did they, did they quietly tell Turkey to stop it, or did they send a, post a blog post on it? They posted a blog post on it. This is the first one to get caught breaking Google's pinning model. They didn't get in trouble. They were given a warning. But more importantly, the point Google was trying to make here, they wanted to warn the governments, intelligence agencies, and hackers of the world and say, look, the era of, of fraud, of man the middling Gmail with fake certificates is over. If we see you doing it in Chrome, Chromium, or Firefox, we're going to make it a big deal. So the, everyone who's an, intel, who's an intelligence operator or in government security, they know about this as of December of 2012. Now jump ahead a year to December of 2013, a year later. The French government, the, the, the France Cybersecurity Agency, you're not going to believe this. They began issuing fake certificates to Gmail that were not the real certificates that were signed by the French Cybersecurity Agency. What was France doing? They were spying on their populace. Liberty! But they were spying on their populace. So what happened there? Almost immediately, Google said, screw you, French, and they dropped them from the browser completely. Within a few days, Mozi uh, Microsoft, Mozilla, and Opera dropped them from the browser. This is a very big deal. This is a major government of the world getting fully pushed from the browser, and they, for good reason. And, it and, and just a few months ago, we saw the same thing happen to China, CCNIC. That entire authority was selling certificates. Turkey's involved again, right, I believe. They were selling basically a subroot certificate to Turkey so they can man the middle of their populace yet again. And so CCNIC got fully booted from all browsers. It's a big deal. Just jump ahead now to, just to February 2014. Um, 
Some of you may have to close your ears for a second, so, uh, but uh, this is the Apple go-to fail bug. This is the most utter failure of client-side security for, for HTTPS I've ever seen. It didn't really make the news that much, but this is a huge, this is mammoth. iOS, in every version of iOS and OS X, for a two-year period, does not check the signature in a TLS server key exchange message. What does that mean when your client skips the signature verification step? What does that mean? Any, what that means anybody with ease could man the middle any iOS or OSX HTTPS connection that's using the native stack. And this was open for two years and no one caught it. So let's do some code review. Look up, look in the upper right hand corner, upper right hand corner. Are you ready? Are you ready? Wiggle, 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 wiggle. There we go, thank you. Where's the bug? What's that? No, very specifically, which, which bug? It's not brace issue. The name of the bug is called go to fail. Where's the problem? That second go to fail right here. <coughs> if go to fail and, it, and then go to fail, what are these two lines of code? The final TLS signature verification step? It's called dead code. It will, it's impossible for this code to run. All of my compilers would have caught this about 15 years ago. So one of two things was happening in this era, back, back in like 2013. Either Apple was not doing basic effing assurance of their main operating systems, or it's a back door. If it's early in the morning, it's a fresh day, the birds are singing, I think, it was a, I think it was an innocent mistake. If it's at the end of the day, I've had some to drink, I think it's a back door, so whatever. <laughs> now let's go ahead to Heartbleed. 2014. This is just basic heartbeat API. And this code was checked in like on New Year's Eve, a couple hours before the new year, and everybody was partying and drunk. So I think this is also a backdoor, to be honest with you. Here's how it works it's a heartbeat API of HTTPS. By the way, about 1% of sites use the heartbeat API, and this caused one of the biggest attacks across the internet we've ever seen. Hey, server, are you still there? If so, reply potato with six letters. Potato. Good. Hey, server, are you still there? If so, reply bird with four letters. Bird. Okay, so far so good. Hey, server, are you still there? If so, reply hat with 500 letters. It's a buffer overflow. Hat, Lucas request the missed connections page. Eve administrator wants to set a new key to this, blah, blah, blah. Now we can anonymously scrape the RAM off of any server. And so people are like, you love the NSA? What this means, I heart bleed the NSA. It's an attempt at humor, right? I was going through uh, at the airport recently in Homeland Security in the U.S. They did not find my little sticker to be as funny as I did. So <laughs> yeah. I left, well, as I was going through security, uh, one of the TSA agents took my laptop and put it in a different container and it got left at TSA and they returned it like three weeks later. So anyways, <coughs> yeah, I'm backdoored. Let's move on. That's Heartbleed. It's a buffer overflow. Now, this is where things are getting hardcore now. As of December of 2014, in Chrome's Canary, they are setting any HTTP site to be marked as insecure. Is this a big deal to you? It should be. It's going to be a big increase in customer service costs. It's going to have a radical impact on, on most companies who do not choose to use HTTPS. Customer support at least will go up. Look, even Mozilla, when they saw Chrome do this, they were like, whoa, that's pretty aggressive. To mark but that's the truth. If you're using HTTP, there's no chance of transport security. We can modify it. There's no way you can trust that information in any way. And so we see this happening. I'm going to skip this for now. So what are your excuses? Here's your last chance. What excuses do you have as to why we should not do HTTPS? One excuse, I mean with respect, was, but my network is private. And the, the, to think your network is private is usually a bad notion. There are so many ways to break into a network today. We want to assume that our whole network is compromised. That's my honest answer to that comment. What other excuses do we have? Problem with load. Oh, performance, you mean? Yeah. Th that's not true anymore. HTTPS is actually faster Good than question. HTTP. Here's what. Hang on for a second. So a lot of people say that TLS SSL is slow. It's a big performance bottleneck in some way. This is not true anymore. Go look at is TLS fast yet? And you'll see that there are a whole bunch of configuration options to actually, and using HTTP 1.1 and Speedy to make HTTPS radically faster and, and more performant than even HTTP. Go ahead.
that's fine. You terminate at the load balancer. Then you re-enable HTTPS from your load balancer and your web server. Then you terminate the web server. Then you reinitiate HTTPS from your web server to your transaction server, to the database, or your caching server. Where do you do HTTPS? Everywhere. So that, that problem is solvable, right? Yep, it is. But, oh, and the other complaints we have about d certificates. Who thinks certificates are too expensive? Right? If you think a 300 euro certificate is too expensive, that makes you a CB. Do you know what CB is? Cheap bastard, right? <laughs> so buy your certificates. In fact, there's even pro projects like the Let's Encrypt project. There's Start SSL. You, there are ways to get cheaper free certificates if you're a CB. Mr. Wylander, sir. Yeah, it's just the irony. It is funny. Pick the Chromium credit. <laughs> 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 With the blog post about marking that. Up. And, and I, 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 give, I give Chromium credit. Let, 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 let's check this out, John. You, <laughs> I did, I, that one was HTTP and I already fixed it. Let's fix this one. Uh, okay. <laughs> but but let, 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 let's see if it's actually going to work. Actually, Chrome, <laughs> HTTPS. What was it again? It's Chrome.com? Chromium.org. HTTPS. You're kidding me. It, it, this is the great irony if it's going to work. Yep, you're right, John. <laughs> No, 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 there it is, there it is. They redirect, I'm sorry, it is supported here. So we got it, and, let, let, and let, in fact, let's check them out. I just typed it in wrong. So they got it, John. And we'll, we'll see how good they're doing. We'll come back to this in just a moment. Remove the www. What's that? Remove the www. No, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be comprehensive here. I'm, I'm, I'm moving fast here, we're moving fast. You got your HTTPS, John. It's a very fair complaint, but they do support. They, they do, and they, see, I type HTTP. They auto read, they auto 302 to me HTTPS. That's not perfect, but it's at least reasonable. The best servers out there, especially internet servers, you know what happens to port 80? Nothing. It's shut down. They're only available to HTTPS. So most of all excuses, how about, oh my, my God, you're breaking caching and filtering. You can accomplish that same goal in the client or on gateway type of security solutions. There are ways to pull this off. It is going to be more challenging, but it is doable if you want truly strong HTTPS. Sir. Uh, if I want to use your web service inside my private network, yes. is it okay to have to use self-signed certificates as well? I would use your own private authority or use mutual TLS with pinning between, between two servers. Don't do HTTPS in one direction internally. Each server should authenticate each other so there are, there are ways to do it. The strongest companies will not, will not use self-signed certs. They'll use some kind of local authority to sign the public key so each entity who's exchanging the public key in public can still check the signature against your authority for the authenticity of that certificate as the rest of the TLS connection comes up. This is, and uh, I'm using a lot of words here. It's not terrible. It's, it's doable in a reasonable amount of time. It takes sweat and blood to do it, but it is doable, <laughs> right? How do we improve this? We have, how much time do I have, by the way, sir, at the back? Oh, we got this. So we got three major things we have to talk about. We have to talk about strict transport security, certificate pinning, and forward secrecy. Let's talk about strict transport security first. I think this is a, a fantastic standard. You make a request to my server over HTTPS, I can respond with a response header that says strict transport security for a certain number of seconds and include all my subdomains. That's necessary to protect the user from privacy issues. Now, your browser is not going, has no ability to make an HTTP connection to your server for that number of seconds. So if someone tricks you into typing an HTTP or clicking the HTTP, or if uh, you just type in a domain, the browser will flip it to HTTPS if strict transport security is in play. But what's wrong with this standard? When you open up a browser and type in a website, what do most browsers default to? You just type in swedishmeatballs.se. What do most browsers default to? HTTP. So you make an HTTP connection to my server. I then do a 302 redirect, and then you make an HTTPS connection to me, and then I set the strict transport security headers. What is wrong with that picture? That's how most banks work in the world. If I'm an attacker on your network, and I see the initial HTTP connection, it's like the movie Aliens 2 with the last soldiers almost, almost about to get hit by the last aliens. Game over, man. It is game over. You are either all HTTPS all the time or you're plain text in my world. 
So what you can do to mitigate that, and by the way, here's the, the strict transport security nun. Hello, sister. Um, Jerry Hoff at OWASP wrote a really good video that describes this. Again, it forces the browser to only make HTTPS connections, and it must be delivered over HTTPS. How can we make sure that the first hit to our website over HTTP never happens? That is almost impossible. There is only one initiative out there that will accomplish this goal. This is Google's HSTS preload initiative. And so far, and what, what this means is, you, once you have your site completely HTTPS, and you're already delivering strict transport security headers, you can make a request to the Chromium project to have your, to have your strict transport security configuration for your domain hard-coded in the browser itself. So that first connection over HTTP will never happen. There's only about 1,000 sites doing this today. There's about 5,000 that, that are in Canary waiting to go live. I, if you're not doing this, you're not doing HTTPS at all. I know at the very least, Firefox will pick up this list. IE has agreed to pick up this list. I'm not sure if Safari does, but I hope they do. Most browser vendors have agreed to support the preload initiative in some way. So now the initial HTTP hit will never happen. Fast. Sure, in the mobile client and in a thick client, as a developer, you have way more control to force everything to HTTPS. It's much less of an issue. People don't type in domains into your native, native mobile app. They download it and using it. It's the programmer who makes the choice to use HTTPS. So it's less of a problem in that world. In the browser, we have the user has way more control. So it's way more of a problem. Cool. So that's the preload initiative, how to get your site hard-coded in most major browsers. So even the first hit to your site is HTTPS. So I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. Um, I'm going to get, and, uh, and by the way, most major browsers do support strict transport security today. It's well over 99% of all browsers. Let's look at certificate pinning. Okay, awesome graphics, certificates flying, certificates flying, mobile, mobile certificates flying, evil, ser evil servers, more certificates. Oh my God, this is awesome. It's like a Hollywood movie, more evil certificates, servers. Okay, let's get to it. So certificate pinning, there's two kinds of pinning. Th we talked about this when we saw Turk Trust getting popped, right? We can take a copy of our certificate of our public cert and hard code it in a mobile browser or in a thick client with ease. And then when someone uses your native application, they make a request to the server, over HTTPS, if we don't get the exact cert back that was hard-coded in the app, the mobile app will complain and say this is not a safe connection and bail. That's certificate pinning. It's a key continuity scheme. So even when your client gets a fake but see a signed and valid certificate, it will ignore that properly signed certificate that's fake and reject it. The other kind of pinning is called tofu pinning, trust on first use. One of the major implementations of, of trust on first use pinning is the HTTP um, public key pinning extension, which is in, the, which is in the, its request for comments period at the IETF. What this does is, when someone makes a connection to your server or HTTPS, you can say, hey, by the way, here's my public certificate, and let's pin it. So if, it, so if that certificate ever changes, let's alert the user that something's going wrong here. And so um, the, the, the key note here is, uh, um, and also, if anything goes wrong, you can set, spit out a report URI to tell your server which authority uh, broke this or, or, or signed this fake certificate in some way. I like to pin four certificates. I pin the public cert signed by one authority, another public cert signed by another authority, and then when I get halfway to certificate expiration, I pin another certificate for each authority so when we pass the certificate expiration boundary, I have those certs ready pinned. Because if you pin a certificate, suppose you have a, a certificate that expires in two weeks and you pin it for four weeks, you denial of service your user base. So it's important that you start pinning a new cert well before the expiration boundary is passed. So, and here's some calls to open SSL to set your pinning headers. Here's what, Google, here's what Chrome says when pinning is detected and the cert is not, is not uh, the cert is not properly validated by your authority. Attackers might be trying to steal your information from Google. Um, example, passwords, messages, or credit cards. So if your users are clicking through this, there's no hope for them. Let's move on. I'm going to move ahead here. I'm going to jump ahead here. I want to talk about just one more thing. Let's talk about PFS, perfect forward secrecy. The main risk I'm worried about here is that passive attacks against HTTPS. 
if I'm going to tack around your network, I can record and sniff your encrypted traffic all day long without you knowing I'm doing it. I'm not, I'm just recording your traffic. I'm not able to decrypt it yet. I'm just recording the ciphertext for later investigation. And again, I can do this all day long. You'll never see me do it. It's a passive uh, endeavor. And then I'll send my secret agents at your server, break into your server, steal the private key, and now I can decrypt any communication that that server ever made if your ciphers are not perfect forward secrecy ciphers. This is a passive attack mitigation. So we have two classes of ciphers in the world today. We have like most people use, uh, they're using RSA for your, uh, for key exchange. It, it's, it's not perfect forward secrecy and it's vulnerable to passive attackers who are recording your traffic. And I recommend elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman. This is very debatable though. There are lots of good researchers who note that the curve data hard-coded into this algorithm came from an NSA agent who, who did this work. So I, I recommend ECDHE. Most cryptographers who've been analyzing this for years have not found a back door in it, but there are European standards, which I'll add to this deck at a future time. So this is an example. We're using elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman for key exchange. We're using AES in Galois counter mode, a high integrity and high confidentiality version of the AES encryption algorithm. And so I'm going to skip this as well. I got like four minutes, right? Yes. The other things you want to consider is drop SSH1 from your chain. There should be no SSH1 signature in any part of your certificate chain. In fact, we're going to see some, and, and the cost to crack, the cost to crack SHA-1 and your chain today is relatively expensive. Um, it's getting cheaper. It's going to be almost free in about 10 years. So we see that SSL labs and other, and other evaluation services are heavily downgrading if any part of your cert chain is signed by SHA-1. In fact, uh, Google's going to kill it off. As of Chrome 13, September of 2004, if you have a cert that expires in January 2017 using SHA-1, they're going to give you a yellow, the yellow triangle. Proceed with caution. No, as of November of 2014, um, if your cert expires between June 2016, in December 2016, using SHA-1 in the chain, they'll just make it, and they'll, they'll drop the lock and say it's plain text. If you're, you have a cert that expires on or after January 2017, as of right now, they're now actually, cro they're actually showing you that this is a broken site. So they're going to get more and more extreme um, down the road. And it takes about an hour to get a new cert chain. It's not a lot of work to get a new cert. Just do it if you have SSH1 in your chain in some way. RSA is also dead. There's absolutely no reason to use RSA for anything anymore. And we're going to see, uh, as of like right now, we're just a few years out from even uh, uh, 1,024-bit RSA getting cracked. The largest crack we've seen is against 768-bit RSA, which a bunch of students popped. But getting supercomputing power is getting very, very cheap. Within 30 years, even some of the strongest versions of RSA will be cracked as more law continues. So I'm moving away from this now. The option to move away from it now, it's not that difficult. It's a couple of strings in your configuration file. So here's my call to action, folks. So number one, strict transport security. For no, number zero, HTTPS everywhere, everywhere, for every site, for every internal connection, there's no good reason to use HTTP for anything anymore ever. Use HSTS, strict transport security. Force your browser to always use HTTPS and also set up the preload HSTS. So your need to always be HTTPS, it's not just on your server, it's now hard coded in the browser itself. Number two, pinning. Because it's not if your CA goes bad, it's if any CA goes bad, you're screwed. So make sure you pin your certs. In a mobile app and thick client, it's easy. In a browser environment, we have the, pinning, the, the public key pinning headers, which are kind of difficult to use, but take the hit, especially for high value websites. Number four, I'm gonna skip this for now, forward secrecy. People who are recording your traffic, keep them at bay. Make sure you're using a modern cipher. These are actually more performant and more secure. And move away from RC4, move away from RCA, and uh, I'm going to leave this certificate revocation information in the slide deck, with the, which I'll publish uh, through the conference here. More certs flying. It's very exciting, very exciting. So again, we talked about HTTPS. We talked about TLS, configuration. We looked at pinning when, when you get fake certificates. We got forward secrecy to stop passive attackers. We got strict transport security. So uh, 
We force the browser always use HTTPS. And for your, oh, this is my buddy, Ivan. Ivan, you're awesome. Ivan, Ivan wrote SSL Labs. This is a non, it, even though it's from his company, it's a non-commercialized site to let you for free evaluate how your server is doing. And so let's go check how, we, we did, a, did a check earlier, right? And we see that the Chromium project, oh, Johnny, come on, Google, this is horrible. They're using SSL3 for no reason. So the, for, for a, major, uh, a major important site, like Chromium, which drives all of Chrome, which drives the heart of the web today. This is not just bad, this is horrible. The point, but now I want you to use this for your sites. It gives you a very good formula to fixing these problems and why it's bad. And uh, let me see if I can pull this off real quick. How about, um, how about my company, Manico.com? Am I just a big talker or am I doing the work as well? Let's take a look at this. Oh, we're doing any questions before we finish up? Bring them on. Questions, questions, questions. What do you got? Still not sure about uh, how the uh, company is uh, working. Where do you, where do you come from? I go to Trustwave three years ago. I give them a couple million dollars. They give me their private key of Trustwave. Trustwave is in the browser. Yeah. So now I can go, you're making a connection to your bank, and I'm, in a, I'm on a network device in the middle. I get your initial connection, I make a fake version of your banking certificate, oh, and I got the private key and authority that I bought from Trustwave, I sign it and give it to you. What do you say? That's great! Unless you're pinning, you think it's great. This is how governments do data, and that's how governments have been mantling middling at great scale. This is how certain servers cache HTTPS, and this will go away if you do certificate pinning as best you can across all your clients. Um, we're done. If you have, uh, um, uh, 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 let me see, I just want to, this would be a great note if I can finish it. Come on, six seconds, six seconds. Let's do this. Two seconds, one second. And I'm a one-man company by myself. I'm a bit of a fool and a clown. And it took me about four hours to pull this off. Come on, come on. Go ahead, John. I just have a comment that Please. I agree. And, it's he, he said it that way the first time and, he said it the second time. and that is set in these slides as well. I, I went a little bit fast. Um, yeah, exactly. You set max age zero, wipe it out. Another thing, when you're first doing certificate pinning and strict transport security, set the max age to be like five minutes until you are sure you're doing it right, and then up the time once you know you got it right. This is my site. Any questions on what my grade is? Anyone can do this. Take, all right, pictures, pictures. Go ahead. No pictures, okay? Well, with, again, I'm a fool and I can do it. You can too, and I want you to. This is necessary for good security in the world today. Also, preach the message. Tell, tell other people about it. And with that, I am done. It's been a pleasure. I'm really grateful that you came in to this talk. If you have questions for me, I am jim at manacode.com. Go forth and write secure code. Thank you very much, everyone.